right. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, I'm Frank. Uh, so as uh, as mentioned before, I've created some some libraries that make uh, stupidly annoying things a little bit simpler. Uh, this talk is sort of in that same uh, same area. Uh, before, like uh, I've done a lot of things to uh, simplify uh, working with the file system, uh, taking all of the complicated stuff and making it simpler. Uh, but I do that for uh, for various reasons, and those reasons like I like to unpack. Uh, and uh, next to all the file system stuff that I do, I also do a lot of stuff with events. This talk is not about event sourcing, uh, so I am an author of an event sourcing framework. This is not about that. This is more about uh, more event-driven uh, uh, systems, uh, and more specifically, uh, all of the shenanigans that you can get into trying to get an event from point A in one system to point B in another. Um, while a lot of uh, times we talk about making design decisions, we talk about the abstract notions of, this, uh, of these uh, uh, decisions that we need to make. I thought it would be nice to look at a concrete case that I uh, worked with for a number of years, and that's in FinTech, where uh, stuff is done a little bit differently, and really to dig into that, unpack it, really go deep and sort of understand why the choices were made. So really going from we have sort of nothing to understanding the context and then going into uh, the actual implementation. So when I talk uh, about making design choices, for me it felt a lot like having this kind of a conversation. So uh, what is better, a, a plane or a car? Uh, so uh, a lot of times when I'm in uh, discussions with, uh, with people, right, we uh, discuss uh, choosing technologies like, hey, should I use uh, Kafka or should I use RabbitMQ or is Redis good enough? Right? A lot of this talk is about the merits of the tools individually, but we're not really looking at placing them into a context. Uh, and because this conversation is so, in my opinion, dysfunctional, uh, you often get to these kind of solutions. So instead of a, uh, just a plane or just a car, we're going to get a car plane. And this one looks kind of cool, but if I look at the code that's delivered, it kind of looks like this. <laughs> right? So that's not so, uh, not so great. So uh, what I want to do today is uh, touch on these four points. Uh, first, well, we're talking about an event system. So I want to dig into what I actually mean when I talk about an event system. Uh, then we're looking at the business context, so in what kind of context are we actually uh, designing this. From that business context, we're going to uh, distill a couple of uh, policies and capabilities that we want to design for, so really setting the design goal, and then design for that purpose. So, but first, what's an event system anyway? Uh, well, it is everything that you need to do in order to get some information from one place to another using events. So this covers the code that produces the events. It covers the event itself, the dispatcher, the transport layer, and the consumer. So it's all of that, as the word system implies, right? It's multiple things inside of a uh, constellation that all work to achieve one goal. There is a couple of code constructs that we can use in order to represent these kind of things. So generally, an event is a class, and it has some information inside the class and describes something. So it uh, represents something that has happened uh, in, uh, in a system or in, in a business context. Uh, I'm going to touch upon some code constructs that uh, I've used in, that, uh, in those situations uh, that might not be standard, and one of these is a uh, message envelope. So this is something that you wrap around uh, the event when you want to dispatch it. Uh, and the purpose of that is to uh, have a sort of a body and header uh, uh, constellation, much like an HTTP request also allows you to specify headers to store all kinds of useful information. This is something that we're going to use later on, but I also wanted to already introduce you to that, uh, that concept. Uh, the next thing that we have is a uh, message dispatcher. Uh, and that is, is just for dispatching messages. So this is, from the outside, the only thing that you know about this. Uh, on the other end, we're going to receive messages. Uh, for, so for that, we have an interface as well to, uh, to bind into that. And then we're going to handle them individually. So the event system, that's all of that, basically. Uh, but it's not just the code. It's also the design decisions, like how do they impact the technologies that we use? Uh, 
can we just pick any technology and just do what we like, or do we need to satisfy certain uh, things? But it's also more than that. It's also about being able to have uh, observability into uh, to how our event system works. Uh, but I think most importantly, we need to understand the why, the what, and the how, and especially that why we're designing it this way. And for that, I want to introduce you the, the business context in, uh, in which this uh, event system was created. Uh, and this was at uh, Molly. So before I worked at Personia, I worked at Molly. Uh, and Molly is a fintech, but it's not just a fintech. Uh, it's more specifically, it's a payment service provider. So it allows you to do online payments. Uh, the organizational context that's relevant here is that the uh, company is in hyper growth. So this means from a few teams to many teams. Uh, to give you uh, an example of that, uh, Molly bought a new office. By the time we moved in, the office was already too small for the entire group, right? So uh, that was pretty stellar growth. Uh, the original system was a monolith uh, with a high level of internal consistency. Everything was wrapped in one database transaction, all nice and uh, nice and fuzzy inside that uh, uh, transactional boundary, uh, but we're moving to services, which means more uh, networks and more errors. Um, we're in finance, and typically in finance, people don't like to take risks, so that means no big bang releases for anything. Everything that you introduce needs to be backwards, or preferably uh, compatible, uh, possibly doing two things at the same time if you're transitioning from one way to another. Uh, we were also transitioning from on-prem to on-cloud because that is super cool and useful and going to solve all of your problems, quote unquote. Uh, so this means that technologies will be changing. Looking a little bit deeper into, uh, into a PSP, um, generally any type of PHP, Stripe, this is going to work uh, roughly, uh, roughly the same. Um, what the user wants to do is the user wants to get goods from the merchant in order to get goods from the merchant. Uh, they need to pay the merchant. Uh, unfortunately, it is not really easy or possible to directly pay the merchant, so we can't, can't go from the user bank to the merchant bank directly. Um, so that's, that's not possible. Instead, they use a payment service uh, that's provided by the fintech. Uh, when the transaction is successful, uh, the user bank wires money to the fintech bank uh, as well as the payment service needs to inform the accounting service uh, of this uh, transaction. The transaction is then recorded in the accounting service and this allows the uh, fintech to see what money needs to go where. Money is first wired to the fintech in a sort of escrow, so a confined space where the, uh, the money is safe uh, from them going bankrupt, and then sent to the merchant. So it's never really direct, it's always indirect via the fintech. So that's all nice, right? The, the user and the merchant are happy, uh, but uh, for example, if the uh, event for some reason, whatever, uh, is not uh, transmitted from service A to service B, uh, things start to go off, right? So the accountant service doesn't know about this uh, payment, uh, so it's not going to send the money. Uh, the user is going to be confused because they paid the money, and the merchant is going to be angry, and we look like a clown. Right? So that's, that's generally not a situation that we want to end up in. So in order to make sure that we're designing for the right thing, we can set up a domain policy. And this domain policy is a way to express a need of the business in, in context to the business. And for this one, uh, uh, we took when, a payment, when the payment system processes one payment, so uh, the merchant, uh, the uh, user has paid uh, uh, the merchant through our system, then one payment must be recorded in the big bookkeeping system, and it needs to be done in a timely manner. So within one, one minute, this needs to show up. Out of this, we can distill some capabilities. So a capability is um, sort of a requirement, but more focused on the outcome. So you are describing something that you want to get out of it, and they can be, be abstract. And for the event delivery, uh, we uh, created a couple one. So we uh, said that the events must be delivered at least once. The events must be processed at most once, and we're going to dig into why this is relevant and uh, how you can uh, ensure this. 
and events must be processed within one minute. So now let's uh, again go one layer deeper and sort of uh, go into these uh, uh, requirements, explore why they are relevant and how we can uh, cater to them. So the first one is at least once delivery. So this is ensuring that messages are dispatched once uh, or uh, dispatched uh, when and only when the model is successfully persisted. So we expect that, that there's uh, some kind of a payment model. Uh, this payment model has done the payment. We need to persist it and we also need to uh, uh, produce an event for this. So the normal sort of uh, failure scenario is usually, right, uh, uh, the, the producer sends the message to the queue, the queue sends it to the producer, uh, the producer or the consumer uh, uh, gets the message, tries to process it, but something goes uh, wrong. So what usually happens? Well, this is just a normal uh, uh, retry loop, right? So we get the uh, event another time and then everything is fine. Uh, what I think is more interesting is like when stuff fails to get into the queue in the first place, right? This is where we can get inconsistencies. So to dig yet again a little bit deeper, what usually happens is that people have uh, this sort of a setup in their application. So they have a service of some kind uh, and it needs to uh, store some stuff in, into the, the database, but it also needs to uh, uh, produce an event. So if we can't send uh, or we can't persist this to the database, we generally say we accept this thing has gone uh, pear-shaped, right? So we opt out, no message is delivered to the consumer. That's usually fine. But what if the second request fails, right? So we do store something in the database, but we don't send it to the queue. Uh, this problem is caused by the fact that there are two network interactions here, and two network interactions cannot be made consistent or atomic. Um, but there is a different uh, way to do that. But just first to outline, sort of give you an illustration of uh, how often this, uh, this can happen. Just a few days ago, I uh, uh, tweeted a, uh, uh, a reaction to Erica Heidi on Twitter. Uh, and somebody liked my tweet. So I got this in my notification. I open up my notifications, I see this. All right, cool, I see that uh, Bruno has liked my very inspirational one emoji tweet. Uh, that's awesome. Um, so I click on it and I see this. I see my tweet. I see that Bruno has liked it. I see my like counter on zero. And I see that there's one reply to my tweet. I go to my tweet, there's no likes. So I kind of feel sad now, but there's also no response, right? And so usually this is an indication that somewhere along the line between producing this message and actually uh, processing it, this message got lost along the way, and this is the uh, user effect of that. Now imagine if you're processing a payment and you are somebody who sends money over the wire to somebody else. You've lost money. You go to your bank account, uh, maybe that money is not gone or is gone, and you uh, ask the merchant and maybe they've seen the money and maybe they don't, right? The thing is, for social media, this is kind of all right, right? Uh, if this happens once in a, uh, even if it happens once in uh, 10,000 uh, times, uh, yeah, we kind of shrug it off, like there's no uh, lives lost on this. Well, in the fintech industry, Everything is about trust. And if people don't trust your product, people are not gonna use your product. If you're gonna go towards a merchant and you're gonna buy their goods and you, uh, your money is gone and uh, uh, they won't ship you the goods because they have not received any funds, right? The shopper is gonna not trust the merchant and because of that, the merchant is gonna put the blame on the FinTech. They're gonna call, literally gonna call the service desk and say like, hey, this has happened. And because uh, uh, PSPs are effectively playing a margins game, if one out of 100,000 uh, payments causes support, right, their margins are so thin that if one in a thousand is already uh, uh, a service call, they've lost all of their profits, right? So this is very important to get right for them. So luckily, there's a solution to this problem. So we said before, there are two network interactions, so we need to make them consistent. Well, there's a, a pattern that we can use for this in order to comply with this, and this is called the transactional outbox pattern. 
And what it effectively does is make use of database transactions where they can uh, make sure that two operations fail or succeed at the same time. We do this by starting a transaction, and then we can insert or update the domain model, uh, but also add our uh, events to a database sort of buffer. And so, obviously, we've all heard the advice like, don't use your database as a queue, and generally, I would agree with that. But if we look at this trade-off of consistency versus this um, generally best practice, like what do we need to choose? Well, for the business, it's much more important to get this kind of consistency. We're, so we're going to use that. Uh, inside of our repositories, that means that if we're going to persist the domain model, then we're going to uh, persist the domain events alongside of that. So the code might look something like this. So we begin a database transaction, we update the model, we insert uh, the uh, events into the outbox, and we commit the transaction. If something goes back, we roll back, and everything is was it before. And so this makes sure that the events and the domain model are uh, stored consistently. So if we look at our previous diagram, where first we uh, go into the database, and then we actually produce it uh, to a queue, Instead, what we're going to do is convert it into this. So the service is going to uh, produce the events and store the domain model. And that's uh, uh, the domain uh, events are going to be um, sort of relayed. So like, like a network relay, uh, you're going to take it from one point and sort of deliver it to the next. Uh, and so you can write this yourself, literally just a, uh, a polling uh, thing on a, uh, on a worker, or you can use more specialized tooling like Debezium, which actually looks at the bin log and forwards the requests uh, or the events from your uh, bin log to the queuing system that you have. It's mostly catered towards Kafka, uh, but you can set up uh, similar things. So, right. so that makes at least once delivery uh, sort of uh, a done deal for us. Um, but at least once delivery is only one end of that delivery pipeline. So on the other end, you have the consumer. So the queue uh, needs to get the message towards the consumer, so it delivers the event. The consumer then goes ahead and processes this, and then sends an acknowledgement, which makes sure that the event is discarded. But if something fails while processing the event, we actually go into a different loop, and that's the following. We get a negative uh, acknowledgement, so uh, we say, this didn't work, it needs to be re-delivered, re right? So we get another pass at this. But every horizontal line is effectively a network interaction that can go wrong. So what if the acknowledgement goes wrong, right? This means it's going to be retried, but if the processing of the event actually worked, this means that we're going to get this thing delivered twice. And this can be a problem. The problem is that sometimes if you process twice, you don't get the right result. And so we need to ensure that we uh, guarantee at most once processing. And for this, we need to look at item potency. So uh, while uh, I think some definition of insanity is uh, doing the same thing twice and expecting a different result, uh, item potency is uh, trying to do the same thing twice but then getting to the same result. Uh, and to see why this is a, is a problem, we can look at some, uh, uh, some examples. So there are some things which are naturally item potent. So for example, if I say my balance was updated, so I have uh, some money in my wallet, uh, I have 100 euros in my wallet. If I tell you this again, you're going to know the same information, right? Not a problem. This is all good, item potent. However, if I actually communicate the delta, so I say I have now got 100 more in my account. I'm going to process this five times. I'm going to make money out of thin air, right? So that's not a possibility. So this is, this is not right. Um, depending on the situation, a uh, naturally idempotent uh, uh, message or a not idempotent style uh, message might be relevant, but we still need to make sure that we can handle these things in an idempotent way. And for this, we can introduce an idempotency key. So we can add a, a UUID, or a, in this case, a ULID uh, to that uh, event so that we know, like, hey, have we processed this event in the, in the past? 
It's all right, this can work. And what we can do, there's multiple ways to solve this, but one uh, sort of naive way is to create a table with a unique index on the event and make sure that the thing that you're storing and the recording of the event being processed is, is again, one atomic operation. So what this means is that if you get the same thing twice, you're going to get a duplicate field violation, right? So this event is already known. And if that's the case, we know that we've already processed it in the past and so safely can, uh, can discard this. You, you have to be careful with this kind of stuff, right? Uh, it's not, you cannot blindly do this because the duplication might also uh, happen in the, maybe the balances or whatever, whatever you're doing. So you need to make sure that it's actually coming from the table uh, of the item potency guard and not your uh, other model. Uh, but still, this is something that you can apply. If we then look back at our interfaces, well, we can uh, uh, look at how can we do this consistently, right? So uh, in the case of uh, Molly, we had normally dispatching through RabbitMQ. We also used outboxes where we're moving to GCP. So that meant, uh, what's that, uh, pops up, right? Uh, pops up uh, is something that you, uh, that you need to use uh, while you're on Google. Uh, but we were also exploring th things like Kafka. But if we want to uniformly and across the board make sure that we can always guarantee item potency for whatever we pass through the system, we can actually decorate the message dispatcher and make sure that everything always gets a uh, unique ID. And this is also why the envelope is, uh, and the message uh, wrapper is so uh, important, because we don't need to modify all of the individual events to hold this information. We can just tag it along as if it is a stamp on a postcard. So that's pretty useful. So that is at most once processing. And so the last thing that we had in our policy is in-time delivery. Well, we need to ensure that the messages are delivered in time. But we also know that we have got a lot of networks, uh, network interactions, multiple systems. And all of these systems can go down for whatever reason or become slow. Uh, so the truth of the matter is that you can't really guarantee that things are going to be delivered in time. But it doesn't mean that you don't do anything. What you do is actually you monitor your delivery. So you're going to look at a couple of key facets that you want to get uh, uh, observability on, so know how the state of the system is, uh, and uh, track all of those things. So just as a couple of examples that we used in order to, uh, to, uh, to guarantee this and spot trends and being uh, alerted in time, you need to know uh, what the delivery latency is. So from the time that you get supplied, uh, that you've produced the message to the first possible moment that the consumer can consume is, how long did this take? And this uh, is um, actually from dispatcher to consumer. The processing latency, so how long did the individual jobs take while processing uh, each of the messages. But the consumer leg is effectively spanning over uh, all of that. And so this is what the customer notices. So if you have a payment being done in one system, the time it takes for them to see it in the report, right? that's what the customer notices. And you want to make sure that you've got a, a, a good amount of observability on that. You also want to know how many times stuff fails to see like, hey, do I need to make something more fault tolerant or is there something more that needs to be, uh, needs to be done there? For this, once again, we can use the message dispatcher interface and decorate the original uh, uh, dispatcher uh, to create some useful information here. So we can use uh, this mechanism to do this uniformly. Uh, for, the, uh, for this time, we're going to use the time of recording, which we're going to get from a uh, clock. So this is a, uh, a timestamp of some sorts that on the dispatching side says like, hey, this is when I sent the message, and this is the, uh, the information that we're going to use on the other end, and now we're going to use the other end of that uh, interface to decorate that. Uh, so we do uh, metric collection for that. We're going to take that time of recording and actually uh, uh, transfer that to our metric collection uh, uh, system. So this is how we were uh, managing all of the uh, uh, metric collection, regardless of what the underlying technology is for key metrics around deliverability. So if you're in a situation, and like, I forgot to give this disclaimer at, uh, at the start, right? these 
uh, things that I outline here, they're very context specific, so they might not uh, be the case that you, that you need this. If you're not changing these kind of technologies, it doesn't always make sense to optimize for having a interface that is uh, implementation agnostic. Uh, but if you're in any type of long-lived uh, uh, product, like a payment service provider, like that code base that I was working on was 17 years old, right? So in 17 years uh, time, you're gonna change technologies multiple times over. So it makes sense to optimize for those kind of changes. So here you see a couple of examples that you can, uh, can apply uh, while uh, catering to those uh, kind of needs. The next thing, because you can't guarantee it, it doesn't mean you can't promise it. And so what we did was uh, set up a couple of SLAs, and this was, uh, uh, so this, those are service level agreements. Uh, they can be external, uh, internal uh, towards your uh, own uh, internal stakeholders, but they can also be towards your customers. Like, we will always uh, make sure that your accounting is in time within X or Y seconds. And for SLAs, there's a couple of things that you need to uh, keep in mind. So the SLA is the agreement that you have outwards, and you want to know when, when, you, uh, when you break it. Uh, but you also want to be alerted well ahead in time so you can fix whatever is going wrong before uh, going to, uh, uh, that you're gonna break the agreement. And this is called the service level objective. So the objective is a barrier that you set where you say like, hey, if, if this metric, so this indicator or thermometer, uh, be it what you uh, want to call it, uh, goes over this, uh, uh, this amount, I want to be notified of it. So you can proactively uh, sort of look at the problem before it actually becomes a problem for your customers. Uh, again, super risk uh, averse uh, uh, industry, so all of these uh, things are, uh, are pretty uh, strict in that regard. So now we've also got uh, the, the last one. So by going really uh, sort of deep from what is the service area, what is sort of the area that we want to do, get a message from place A to place B, placing that in a domain context, we can look at uh, domain policies uh, and then at capabilities in order to make sure that whatever we're designing for, that we're really doing it uh, for those, those reasons. So we don't get that weird uh, flying uh, bus looking uh, thing, but we can actually get something that's valuable for, uh, for our company. So just to recap, uh, the events, at least once delivery, we make sure that we do this by having uh, a transactional outbox. Uh, not standard, but super useful. Uh, we needed to make sure that events are processed at most once, and we can do this through consumer item potency. We know that we need to process each, uh, each event within one minute, and for that, we used availability and metrics and back them up using SLAs. So effectively, this is uh, sort of like the alternative uh, title for this talk, and it's how to be totally paranoid about getting your events from uh, place A to B, and it's only relevant because of the context uh, that we're in. So. Understand the, the context at hand is, uh, is, is crucial for this. Uh, you need to set up a couple of design goals to really know before you go into the implementation, like why am I doing this in the first place? How will it affect my customers? How will it affect internal operations? How will it affect the bottom line of the business, right? The profitability that we sp uh, spoke about before. And actually then we can go into implementing for that specific purpose. Now, a, a final note about this, like, we didn't uh, set up all of the design up front. We actually took a iterative approach to this, and this is generally what I recommend. So look at the thing that's most important or impactful for your customer. Like get the known culprits out of the way uh, at first, but then uh, go into uh, some of these more edge cases, especially around the failure modes, right? You don't need to design uh, uh, for them uh, right out of the gate. Uh, we actually implemented outboxing uh, a lot later because the amount of uh, traffic that we got uh, sharply increased, so this uh, problem got bigger and bigger for us, which warranted uh, um, uh, the need for us to invest in this. So 
When you know this, uh, implement uh, it for a specific uh, purpose. And that is how we designed a mission-critical event system for a fintech company.